Hey guys, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell to be updated every time I make a new video. Thanks, let's begin. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Brian, and I am now known as the Horror Shark, not the Horror Show host. I know that most of you know that, but I don't know if John knows that. <laughs> um, I know it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I've had John on the show before. We uh, talked about Deep Blue Sea 3 when that came out, and he had directed that, which was a great film. Um, the best sequel Thanks. so far, in my opinion. Um, so now he's directed a new film, uh, Eraser Reborn, which is more of a requel to the original Eraser from 1996 that starred Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's worked on a lot of other projects, like writing and uh, directing, so he's got a lot of credentials on his, on his resume, so he's, got, he's a good dude for doing this. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you're not saying I'm just old. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's get right into the questions. But if, first off, congratulations on having Eraser Reborn out on Blu-ray now. It's got to be a great feeling. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know what? Uh, it was a really kind of an amazing experience. We were very fortunate that we got to do it at the height of COVID yeah. uh, in South Africa. Um, it was, you know shooting a movie in COVID is very, very challenging. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, we had a, a uh, extremely um, hardworking, uh, talented cast and crew that sort of was very patient with us as we kind of navigated this, this new world of filmmaking and, and all of the, uh, the, the health precautions that we needed to sort of try and keep everyone safe. So um yeah, I'm really happy that it's that it's out now. Very excited about people seeing seeing the movie. Yeah, and speaking of South um, South Africa, what was it like filming in Cape Town? I know that's more of becoming like a regular for a lot of lower end, well, not lower end, lower budgeted films. Just, it's kind of like the new Bulgaria, kind of, uh, but a little bit more highbrow. <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I think I should probably uh, answer that in a very politically correct way because um, I haven't shot in Bulgaria. But um, yeah. for me, um, the the crew is quite deep in South Africa, particularly in Cape Town. They have a lot of extremely talented artists there uh, who've been making movies for a while. And I think that South Africa is sort of coming into its its own um, from a sort of creative perspective, um, uh, a lot of South Africans work throughout the world, um, and there's a lot of sort of foreign movies that come to South Africa to double uh, South Africa for other parts of the world. And what was really exciting to me was to be able to shoot South Africa for South Africa right. um, and Cape Town, Cape Town for Cape Town, um, and not have to kind of wishy wash our way up and and Try to you know have a double for LA or or you know other other uh, other looks. Like um, so for New was York. An, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it was it was kind of an amazing. It's an amazing environment to shoot a movie in. Um, the thing I love about uh, uh, South Africans, I sort of uh, allude to in the movie, which is that um, they don't take no for an answer. That's mm -hmm. sort of culturally part of what they do. So any kind of crazy, ridiculously ambitious ideas that, that we have um, are, you know, within, within bounds and they're like, okay, let's, let's figure it out. So um, it was really refreshing to work with uh, people that um, were not interested in the word no uh, and were interested in, you know, how do we achieve this uh, under some, you know, extraordinary budget uh, restrictions. So um, I, I love it. I love working down there. I've been fortunate to use some of the same uh, crew um, and um, uh, can't wait to go back there again. Yeah. How was it working? Like you had worked on Deep Blue Sea 3 in Cape Town and it was more so on the water. So how was it kind of working around the locations, like the houses and everything? Was that like a whole different vibe for you or? It's a great question. You know, um, so Deep Blue Sea, we shot most of it, uh, you're exactly right, um, at Cape Town Film Studios. Um, and um, I was really pretty nervous because um, 
uh, again, like the the ambition and the amount of locations in the script was was a kind of absurd. It was absurd, and um, I wondered, you know, how are we how were we going to be able to sort of navigate being in the city, being in the country, being you know all over the region uh, in twenty three days. Um, and we were very, very fortunate in that the people that we had working locations, production designer, you know, everybody from top to bottom uh, spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out kind of a puzzle of a plan to make this work. Um, and I found that um, they were so organized that a lot of the bugaboo issues about multiple locations that I usually have shooting elsewhere were taken care of in advance. So we could just, you know, do, spend a lot more time shooting the movie and a lot less kind of dealing with the logistical um, chaos that, you know, usually sort of follows shifting, shifting uh, locations all the time. So we found uh, a couple core locations that were sort of little base camp uh, locations where we could walk um, or almost walk to you know, multiple places within within one base camp. And that sort of helped us out a lot in terms of our pl planning. And I think we actually had something like 52 locations in this in the script uh, that got cut down a little bit, but we're, we're all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was really just, just amazing planning. Uh, uh, logis you know, we, we just had a really good, good plan. Um, and um uh, you know, going from a, a, a township one day, the logistics of shooting in a township safely, as you can imagine, is just boggling. But, you know, they, they figured it out um, and they've got the experience to figure those sorts of things out. You know, a township in one day, downtown Cape Town, the next farm on the next day. And just sort of uh, I'm kind of astonished at, at the work that they put into making that happen. So that was really our, our crew. Yeah, was um were there a lot of restrictions or like even permits you had to get on the area just to uh, shoot some of the scenes? Because it was it was, it was a lot like uh, the U.S. when you have you film on the street, you gotta get a permit, and there's all these restrictions. Was it similar to that in Africa too? Um, it's pretty much the same. Um, I would say that um, there they're prob they're probably a little bit more flexible. Uh, and um, there are fewer kind of neighbor issues and some of the, the things that you face here in the States there because they're so uh, eager and welcoming of the film community and shooting on location. And we also didn't really shoot in residential neighborhoods. Um, so some of the restrictions that you face, we, we, just, we just didn't have. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of safety, in terms of permitting, it's, it's very similar to it, you know, to what we've got in the States, uh, getting security. Um, and then you have to add on all of the COVID um, restrictions, for example, when we were shooting uh, crowd scenes, um, you know, all of the, there had to be a, a buffer and a barrier space between uh, what we were <coughs> shooting and, um, you know, the, the actual people that were that were in the neighborhood. Um, so there was an additional layer of uh, crazy logistics to sort of keep everyone safe, not only within our bubbles, but also within the bubbles that were surrounding where we were shooting. Um, and so that was just like, uh, I mean, it, it took an army of people to kind of figure that out. Um, they all said but, yes. Uh, they, they all said yes. Well, they, they, <laughs> they were, they were, we're happy. To, they're happy to have us. They yeah. they are very very film friendly down there, and that certainly helps uh, with getting the um, the permits, etc. Um, I know you had a hand in the script for the original Eraser to some extent. Um, so did this recall act as a vision of what you had in mind for the original? That's a really good question. So. Um, the answer to that is is pretty simple. Uh, on the original Eraser, I was brought in basically as a gun for hire to work on some specific sequences and character beats. Um, and so I was not part of the overall um, story concept zeitgeist um, 
of the movie at all. I was just like brought in, like, let's, let's work with this sequence. Let's work with that sequence. Um, so I, I can't claim to have any kind of um, uh, ownership on the, or the original other than I was sort of, uh, you know, a mechanic that was brought in for certain sequences, some of which some people didn't think needed mechanicking and some of which, you know, there was sort of general agreement, but I didn't do a ton of work um, on the original. It was more sort of just a little surgical work here and there. Um, but it was a really, it was a real privilege to, to work with Mr. Schwarzenegger and, <laughs> and Mr. Russell and Arnold Culpelson and the whole gang at Warner's on a much, you know, a, the movie had a little bit of a different scale. Let's put it yeah, that way. Bigger than budget. This did. Um, <laughs> slightly bigger. So, yeah, just a little um, bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, for me, I just love uh, what the eraser does, the character of the eraser and felt like that could be a character that could continue to live on through other stories. And so when Warner Brothers approached me uh, with this idea, um, I was very eager to sort of get into it and give kind of a, uh, a new life or a new direction um, for a new kind of a racer. And, and Don Sherwood, you know, brought his, his ideas to that as well. And so, um, uh, you know, we we're very kind of excited about, um, you know, rebirthing, rebirthing this character. Um, but, you know, I, I, I can't claim any sort of, you know, creative originality in terms of the original. Um, uh, but it was very interesting when faced with, um, you know, where do we take this next? Yeah. A lot of people will probably be wondering why, but why was there no unique gun like the rail gun in the original? It's a very simple um, answer, which is um, affordability. Yeah. Um, those the, the the visuals behind that, even twenty some years later, um, were extraordinarily ambitious and expensive. Yeah. And um, having the rail guns, which I, you know, love and, and certainly uh, in a snap your fingers, wish fulfillment world would, would love to have involved them uh, somehow. Um, uh, it was just not it was just not visually possible given given our budget. And so we kind of went a different direction with how we were dealing with technology and focus more on how technology impacts identity uh -huh. and the idea of being erased in the modern world. Uh, and that was just the reality of the budget that Warner's was willing to give us. Uh, and so the kind of no rail guns doesn't make sense um, concept came up pretty quickly because we just, yeah. we just, you know, once you go down that direction, you really have to try to do it as well as possible and I just felt like, you know, they did it so well back then, but we just cannot replicate that. Um, plus, we wanted to, you know, come up with our own, perhaps visually more modest <coughs> way of doing things that more directly related to, uh, you know, the idea, the idea of uh, identity and then how that's changed after 20 years. But uh, I, you know, I think it's a great it's a great question. Um, and everyone loves those original rail guns. Um, uh, but we just, you know, if you yeah. can't, if you can't do it right, um, do it. you can't do it. Right. So that's, that's what we, that's what we face. That's the reality. But at least you did something like you took a more grounded approach with like the whole identity thing. And, um, even the weapons that were used, it was like, Oh, so we have realistic guns. It's going to be more, more realistic and more grounded, um, not to go over the top like the original, um, but still just enough to be entertaining. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we, we, cer we certainly do have a lot of weapons and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, hopefully some inventive ways of, of using those uh, in addition to, uh, you know, uh, trying to give a little bit of a, a funny homage to some of the animal work that was done in the original. I was going to say, including um, the animals. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, the animals were, you know, uh, if you had to choose between rail guns and, and animals, I think the animals um, 
uh, were were a little bit more uh, feasible uh, in the realm of poss possibility. Yeah, definitely. Um, how, what makes a racial reborn stand out from the original, in your opinion? Can you define what you mean by stand out? Do you mean uh, what differentiates it, or yeah, well, like what makes it like? So, if someone was to come up to you and say, "I love to watch a race or reborn," but I don't know if it'd be like anything different. So, what would make it kind of special yeah. in that regard? It's a it's a very legitimate question. I think when when uh, pursuing these, you know, what do you call them? Uh, what's Re your word for them? Oh, like a re like a remake sequel. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it's a great, great term. Um, so I, I think um, for me, um, the question that HBO, our partner, was really interested in was how is the concept of identity and protecting your identity and erasing an identity and creating a new one um, different now than it was back then? And I think it's become much, much harder to erase your identity given oh, yeah. social media, given the digitization of our world. Um, and so that was extremely intriguing to us. And within our, you know, within the resources that we had, how could we explore that a little bit while telling what we hope is kind of an exciting story that definitely tonally kept some of the big craziness of the original but was definitely a more kind of, uh, as you put it, more of a realistic take on Eraser. Um, and so um, I think that, that those are a couple of reasons for people to see it. I think also, uh, I think it's intriguing to see what Don Sherwood did with the character yeah. uh, and how it's different than Arnold, because look, you know, Arnold, Arnold is amazing. He's Arnold. You're, there'll never be another one. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, it was an absolute given that we were not going to try to follow in his footsteps, which is impossible. Yeah. Um, but try to create, you know, try to create our own, our own a new take on the character um, with a different backstory, um, but sort of the same job. Um, so, um, I think, you know, seeing, seeing this new version of who the eraser is as a character, I think is also a draw. Uh, and then I think the, you know, the location of South Africa, um, uh, is, is another one. And I think we've got a whole new group of, of actors in this, in this movie. Um, and I, I'm always interested in, in seeing, you know, who the next hopefully crop of new new talent is going to be in action movies. I think we've been rehashing and recycling uh, not only a lot of ideas, but also a lot of uh, our cast and a lot of action movies. So yeah. I, I get very excited about, Oh, maybe there's some new blood, you know, maybe there's some new blood here. Like it, like but, it or not. Yeah. Like that'll um, catch on. And yeah. I, and I think that, you know, McKinley Belcher, the third and, and Jackie and, and Dom and Eddie are, are, uh, four extremely talented actors who um, are just, you know, getting into this space. And uh, I'm super excited to see where they go with it. And I think yeah. their work in the movie was really good. Yeah. So how was it working with the movie cast? Could you see them and or yourself returning for a third Eraser movie? <laughs> well, um, you know, one one thing at a time. Um, yeah. The cast. Uh, so we so we had four. Those four cast um, were international, and then everybody else in the movie was locally sourced. Um, and that was, you know, working with the locals, especially getting uh, if they had to sort of double an American accent was is always very interesting yeah. uh, and, and somewhat of a challenge. Um, and like I said, with the, the, the crew in, in Cape Town, there are also quite a few actors that work all the time, both in commercials, but, uh, you know, on shows like Raised by Wolves, et cetera. Um, so uh, I had a ball trying to find local cast um, to sort of fit in with our four, you know, internationals. Um, but uh, honestly, it, it, my experience as a director sort of starts at the top with our number one with Dom Sherwood, who I just can't say enough about as an actor, but also as a human being. He's just so much of a leader. Uh, and he just, you know, like his character, he gets the job done. 
Um, and uh, we'll do anything, you know, anything to protect you, anything to get the job done. And he did anything as an actor, uh, including waiting for months and months and months during our COVID shutdown, uh, patiently working on the script, working with me uh, on the character um, uh, to, to, you know, get the best result that we, we uh, could get and also to prep as much as possible. So we were actually, in a way, a little bit fortunate that we had a several month delay and I was fortunate as a director that our cast didn't drop out or take other yeah. projects. So they really kind of stuck it out for the movie uh, which I really appreciate. Um, and that, that goes for, you know, McKinley and, and Eddie and Jackie. Um, we had a lot of Zoom time, months and months of Zoom time, because uh, we were cast in November, December, thinking we we're going to go in January. We ended up, ended up, you know, going in April, mm -hmm. uh, April, May. And so um, I had all this time to work with them, albeit via Zoom, uh, and they're, you know, they're just a lot of fun. They're very game. Uh, and they also knew that they were in for kind of a, um, a grueling chaotic haul once they got to Cape Town because of our schedule. Um, and, uh, they were just, they were just incredible to, to work with. And we found some very, very good, um, locals, including Nathan, um, who is just, you know, who, who, they were, they were also equally gung-ho. I think with COVID, there was a desire to connect with others, to give your best, you know, and, and sort of a perspective that we all have a little bit more of a limited um, time to do things than maybe we thought we had in the past. And so everybody was just, was like, you know, spring is here, let's get out and do our best in the limited amount of time that we've got. Um, so I, I had an amazing time working with our cast. So I would ask, what do you have planned next? Possible projects with Warner Brothers that you have in the pipeline, but that's probably more hush-hush than I can actually ask. So um, what would you want to work on next? Like, what would your big... What, what ideas do you have in the future that you think you could ever work on that would be just like a dream project? Honestly, everything I work on, I mean, this isn't a good answer, is a dream project for me. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not that concerned about, um, you know, profile. I'm concerned about story. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I get a lot of uh, pushback sometimes from some people. Oh, you know, it's, it's on demand. It's streaming. It's not in theaters. Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And I really don't care about that. I'm just like looking for really great stories that I can engage with personally. Um, you know, certainly the next Deep, Deep Blue Sea 4 um, could be a priority uh, at Warner's. Um, it's, that's <laughs> a possibility. That's probably one thing that I can mention, but um you know, That'd we'll, my we'll day. see. <laughs> um, well, the, look, look, you know, I am, I'm in love with the the franchise. I'm, yeah. I'm in love with Tanya Raymond's character, Dr. Emma Collins, um, and have just uh, so much fun with these movies. And 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 so, you know, if that becomes a, a reality, that's that's a possibility. Yeah. I also have a whole bunch of whole bunch of great projects. Uh, in the pipeline that are kind of irons in the fire that you kind of have to, you know, you try to heat them up as, you know, as fast as possible. And yeah. some are slow burns and some happen the next day. So, um, in, you know, in terms of dream projects, I really, you know, finding something like uh, the next uh, Invisible Man, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I lo love sort of psychological horror. I've, you know, done some horror. So to go back to that and maybe combine that with a little bit of suspense and action, uh, like they did in that movie would, would be a yeah. fun thing to do. Um, so, you know, I'm a little bit all over the place as I always be have been, but you know, that for me is the fun of it. Yeah. You've gone from the zombies and quarantine or the, the infected, I guess. From quarantine two to ghosts and the quiet <laughs> ones and and uh, sharks and then action. It's like oh my gosh, he's got a full resume of different ideas. He's got all this great, all this diversity in the um in your resume. It's really cool. 
Thanks. So, some may say too much diversity, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm just looking for a, a, a good story. So, um, yeah. we'll, you know, we'll see. Yeah. We'll keep up with the good work. And, um, you guys can check out, uh, Eraser Reborn. It's on Blu-ray and, um, I believe it's on streaming. You said HBO, right? Uh, it will be, it will be on HBO and HBO max in the fall right now. It, it is, for sale and for rental on all platforms. Nice. Um, so yeah, definitely go check that out. And the original Eraser, which is a classic, and none, I don't think it's talked about enough, to be honest. <laughs> I completely agree. The, you know, the the scene, uh, the sequence on the seven forty seven to me is like one of the best. Yeah. Sequences. People really remember the the movie for the rail guns and for the animals, but mm-hmm. to me, that's that sequence is just like yeah. When I saw the so t- much. Yeah, I watched the trailer first, and I'm like, this looks pretty cool. Then that plane sequence happens in the trailer, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's insane. Uh, and Arnold is amazing. So, yeah, um, yeah check, check out the original for sure. As well as the new one, the, the requel. <laughs> the requel. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining me on this stream. I greatly appreciate you having, appreciate having you on again. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to see you again. I love the new moniker. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, wish you the best. You as well. So thank you all for watching. I am Brian Gatto, the Horror Shark. Make sure to like, comment on, as well as share this video. Like my Facebook fan page and support me on Patreon, where even a dollar a month could help keep this channel going on strong, and I greatly appreciate it. Plus, you get access to body counts and other music videos that you can't get on YouTube because of copyright and age restriction. Monetary support, if you want to support the channel through PayPal, it's horrorshow37 at gmail.com. I greatly appreciate that, too. But if you don't want to support me with any money, that's fine. Just hit that notification bell and like the video. And as always, subscribe.